happy 4th of July to all you batch crazy Americans out there. It's time to take a long, hard look at the excess, violence, and insanity lurking under the surface of American Psycho. Based on Brett Easton Ellis's graphic as hell novel from 1991, the story of Patrick Bateman and the drug-fueled Wall Street of the 80s is, well, it's, it's psychotic. Psychotic and violent, like so, so violent. We'll try to do our best to include what we can, but we want to keep this thing monetizable, you know? I mean, <laughs> a fella's gotta eat. So, with no restraint on spoilers, but a fair warning that something gross might sneak through the happy filter, it's time to ask, what's the difference? American Psycho takes all of its scenes from some part of the book. Some of them are rearranged or truncated, but pretty much every stitch of dialogue in the film comes straight from the source material. The simple fact that it's 400 pages worth of book and just 97 minutes of movie means that Bret Easton Ellis' novel is just more detailed, more violent, more racist, and more pornographic across the board. The differences here are more about what the movie didn't include instead of how anything was changed. Even the more innocuous of Patrick Bateman's obsessions are taken to excess in the book. While the movie gives us a detailed description of his morning routine, we only really get one. In the book, we get an even more detailed description, as well as a hyper-specific list of what everybody's wearing in nearly every scene in the book, to the point where it's near impossible to tell anyone apart. While this is a key part of the narrative in both mediums, it's on a whole other level in the book. You really get the sense that everybody literally looks the same. Literally. Like, real literally. But American Psycho is all about a guy who kills people, violently and for insane reasons. So let's talk about the Psycho himself. Movie Bateman is cold and postured, and clearly living behind a mask. In both the book and the movie, he's a stand-in for the greed and excess of the 80s, an extreme example of how insane the whole era was. His sterile, super-modern apartment in the film is really the biggest difference. His apartment in the book features more furniture, more color, a jukebox, even a painting of a naked woman watching MTV in a Martian desert, a far cry from the Spartan white space in the movie. Other than the stuff in his apartment, book and movie Patrick are largely the same. The vast majority of the movie movie's dialogue comes directly from the source material, even if it's rearranged a bit. But again, the novel has way more time to spend with him. Movie Bateman is a shark hiding in plain sight. A rogue, crazy person who just kind of is who he is. It's more a case of a psycho being in the right place at the right time than a psycho who's a product of his environment. Sorbet? Even though we do get narration in the movie, we have much more access to Book Bateman's inner workings. In the opening chapters, we see his fiancée, Evelyn, feeding insecurities about his hair thinning, or weight that he may or may not be gaining. Further into the story, we even see his mother, a drug-addled permanent resident of a hospital who can still only talk to her son about who was at what party and how long did they stay. All of this adds up to a more fleshed-out version of Patrick Bateman. See? Look at all that flesh. In the film, we get a much more direct path to all the killing. It's easy to track how one thing leads to the other. For example, the iconic business card scene. One minute, Bateman can't handle how a tool like Paul Allen has the classiest business card at the table. So, angry and worked up, in the very next scene, he murders a random homeless man. In the book, however, Bateman's bloodlust is much more spaced out. Paul Owen, in the book, has a predictably shitty business card. Bateman freaks out about the business card of some rich guy who everybody hates but has to put up with because he's supposedly worth $800 million, but we only get to meet him once in a restaurant. He's not important. The attack on the homeless man comes after a party that Bateman is just not that interested in. So he leaves early, and he finds the homeless man and his dog after some aimless wandering. He then pulls out a knife from his briefcase, you see, and then oh, he, uh, uh... happy filter on this part, I think. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, so Patrick makes a new friend in an alleyway, and after teasing him with some cash and then being a real nudge about getting a job, Patrick pulls a... Uh, let's call it a magical wand out of his briefcase, and then just starts tickling his new friend with it. Yeah, yeah, he, so he tickles his new friend until his eyes pop out of their sockets. <laughs> and then Patrick, you know, breaks the dog's legs. Jesus, that's the happy filter version? In the movie, we get this wide shot and some yelping, and that's hard enough to watch. Yeah, in the book, this chapter is called Tuesday, and it's followed up by an entire chapter about Genesis and Phil Collins. Anyway, after the homeless guy scene, Bateman is laser-focused on killing Paul Allen, luring him out to dinner, getting him drunk and back up to his apartment, before monologuing about Huey Lewis and axing Paul to death. The book takes a much longer route to Paul Owen's death showing Bateman and his friends and colleagues out at a handful of bars and restaurants before he finally gets around to killing him. Which he does in the same way, except for two differences. 
One, there's no Huey Lewis monologue. Like Phil Collins, that gets its very own chapter later on. And instead of simple blood splatter, the axe actually hits Paul straight in the funny bone. Yeah, silly old Patrick plays hide the axe with his friend Paul. Patrick thinks Paul can't fit the whole axe in his mouth without his entire head falling apart. And wouldn't you know it, <laughs> he can't. Gah. I think the point the Happy Filter is making here is that because the novel is able to take its time, Book Patrick's outbursts seem more random, less motivated than Movie Patrick's. The film actually moves straight into private eye Donald Kimball showing up to ask about Paul Allen's disappearance. In the book, it's like 60 pages before Kimball shows up. In that time, Bateman has lunch with his ex from college, and he's so nervous and antsy he literally can't think straight. He writes her a poem and seems legitimately afraid this woman will reject him. Ultimately, though, he convinces her to come back to his apartment where crazy old Patrick asks Bethany to keep her hands on these two blocks of wood. Yeah, he just asks her to do it. Certainly doesn't do it for her with a nail gun, one finger at a time. Then they play with all kinds of toys for two days. Toys like scissors, pepper spray, chainsaws. Ultimately, she gets tuckered out and goes down for a forever nap. Uh, okay, okay, I, I think we get the point. Look, Movie Bateman's journey is a much straighter line of cause and effect. Kimball questions him about Paul Allen. He blows off steam by torturing a few prostitutes. Lewis Carruthers hits on him in the bathroom, then gets another visit from Kimball. He takes a model home, kills her off screen, then keeps a lock of her hair as a trophy. In the book, all of this gets rearranged. The movie's two separate Kimball interviews are derived from the same scene in the book, when the detective first interviews Patrick, and the Carruthers incident in the bathroom happens much earlier. We see Lewis's obsession with Patrick escalate past Bateman threatening him with a knife to a full-on meltdown at Barney's, where Bateman <laughs> kicks Carruthers in the face to get him to let go of his leg. Plus, killing the model is fully in the novel and sees Patrick play make-believe with his new blonde friend. This time, they're pretending the model's eyes are birthday candles. Happy birthday. It's more of the same ingredients, but in a different order, giving Bateman's M.O. a more random feel in the book. But by the time we arrive at the end of the movie and we get to Bateman's insane action sequence, we find him attempting to feed a cat to an ATM, killing an old woman, in a shootout with the cops, then offing an unsuspecting doorman and janitor before making it back to his office. The book version is kicked off by murdering a street saxophonist, then stealing a cop car and crashing it into a Korean deli, but more or less plays out the same. The film's action sequence is so sudden and so bonkers that it seems like it may be all in his head. In fact, the brazenness with which he commits his murders, the height of which is leaving a trail of blood across his building's lobby before stuffing Paul Allen's body into the trunk of a cab, all seems too strange to be real. The way Patrick frequently says out loud that he's a murderer only to not be heard plays like it's in his head as well. The book, however, makes it feel real. Every time he tells somebody he's murdered, there's a reason they don't hear him. His more elaborate killings are confined to his or Paul's apartment and do not include him running through the apartment building naked and screaming with a chainsaw. You know, because the book takes its time, and we live with Patrick more through the endless parties and inane bickering with his friends about mineral water and pocket squares, through a summer in the Hamptons with Evelyn where, restless, he ends up eating sand and microwaving jellyfish. We know exactly how insane Patrick is. So his atrocities feel real. They feel so real, in fact, that after he kills a kid at the zoo, even eight pages dedicated to Whitney Houston's entire oeuvre starts to feel equally disgusting. Murder and mayhem and unspeakable brutality get rolled into long passages about nothing more than deciding where to eat that night, and packaged into chapters that are as likely to be titled Another Night as they are tries to cook and eat girl. But seeing them play out on screen with much less access to Bateman's inner monologue leaves us with room to doubt. Maybe the things we've been seeing didn't really happen. Or maybe they did. And the lesson is that the hip and modern yuppies, perhaps a new breed of monster altogether, are just gonna get away with it. Bateman's closing monologue from the film is pulled from a passage towards the end of the book, but not the very end. The novel does end with a little more closure than the movie. What we're left with is the experience of living with an American psycho for 400 pages, and the knowledge that he's never gonna stop or be stopped. That's it for American Psycho. I'm going to go find a friend in the bad part of town that can give me some magical candy to help me go to sleep after reading this book. Hey, you remember when that rat eats its way nope, through the- Nope, we're done, Casey. Be sure to subscribe to Cinefix for more What's the Difference, and I may actually come back from this one. That rat was so hungry.